And with that, I will go ahead and uh, segue into this talk from Oli Larkin, and he's going to be um, showing you one way that you can get started with uh, machine learning and getting neural audio and uh, creating plugin. Uh, Oli is the lead developer for the iPlug2 plugin framework and a software engineer at Ableton. And today he's going to be talking about machine learning audio plugins with iPlug2 and Onyx Runtime. Big shout out to data bots in the chat as well. And um, and if you have any questions during this uh, during this presentation regarding iPlug2 and the Onyx Runtime, of course, uh, please feel free to ask, and we will be happy to put those to Oli after the chat after his presentation. Okay, hello. Are you, are you, can I just check? Are you seeing my slides? Okay, great. Uh, yep, yep, we can see it. So yeah, thanks. Um, thanks you all for inviting me on here, and um, I'm I'm pretty pleased to present uh, iPlug2 and um, a little. Well, I'll, I'll get to it, but at the end, there's a little uh, template project like what was being discussed, which uh, might be the way that some people who want to enter the competition might like to. Uh, make a, a neural audio plugin. Um, so yeah, my, my talk is about how you productionize a kind of machine learning model um, in the context of an audio plugin. And uh, yeah, it's I'm doing this with iPlug2, which is the, the framework that I maintain, but uh, you could use the same library with Juice. And in fact, some of the stuff that I've put on GitHub you could also use in a Juice plugin. So um, yeah, stay tuned even if you're um, using Juice. So yeah, I, I came on Josh's YouTube channel um, two years ago, pretty much this month. <clears throat> so I wanted to do a, a bit of a, an update um, about kind of the iPlug, what iPlug2, um, what's been going on with iPlug2. Um, and the answer is not that much because I've been working full time for Ableton for two years. Um, but yeah, uh, we've got a few things in the works. Um, for those who don't know, iPlug2 is a cross platform audio plugin framework, which lets you spit out lots of different uh, audio plugin formats from the same C source code. Um, it can also compile the uh, plugin code to work as a web page. Uh, as a web audio module. And we've also just recently been adding Clap support. So Clap is this new plugin format um, on the scene. So that's currently on a branch, but it's very nearly ready. Um, yeah, so we support Mac OS, Windows and iOS, and Linux is on a branch, but needs some work. Um, and a couple of the nice things about iPlug2, if you're not familiar with it, um, it's got a quite fast and uh, nice uh, GPU accelerated UI toolkit included, which is either backed by Skia, which is a, a very high quality graphics engine, um, but a very big dependency, uh, or something called Nano VG, which is very lightweight and fast. Um, but there's also lots of other options for doing your UI with iPlug2. You can put a web view on top of an iPlug2 um, C++ DSP layer, or you could do your UI with a native framework like Swift UI or UIKit if you're doing an iOS project. Um, and there's examples included that let you um, experiment with those things very easily. And yeah, iPlug2, one of the big uh, things about it is that it has a liberal license and you can uh, hack away at it, uh, make your own fork, uh, change it however you like. Uh, of course, we really, really appreciate pull requests and improvements and uh, people getting involved to, to help make the framework better for, for everyone. So yeah, please check it out on GitHub and join our new Discord community. That was one of my points. We recently moved to Discord, um, which is much better than Slack, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're there now, and I'll put a link at the end of the slides. Um, another bit of good news was that we got a, a not insignificant amount of money um, via this Google Advanced Web Applications grant. And hopefully that's gonna enable us to um, 
both me and Alex, my main uh, collaborator, to to work on it a bit ourselves, but also to get some other people involved to add some important features like accessibility and yeah, improving the web um, side of things. Since the money comes from the advanced web web app grants, we've got to do that. Uh, but it's something we wanted to do anyway. Uh, but there's a few other improvements, like um, some shader improvements that I'm going to land soon, and um, yeah, CMake and things like this. Uh, I just wanted to quickly show a few of the cool plugins that have come out over the last couple of years using iPlug2, things that I particularly like, <clears throat> before I get on to talking about uh, neural plugins. So this, this is one which... Um, is, uh, is it's a synth, it's called Invader 2 by Ephonic. And um, this is kind of cool to see this come, come to light because I was um, making music using Invader version one uh, nearly 20 years ago. Um, and the original version was built using synth edit. Um, and now Ephonic has used iPlug 2 to make a new version. And um, I just really like the UI of this and the UX, um, and it's just a really nice synth. It's a commercial closed source thing, but I think it's quite cheap. Uh, the next one is Yulian's um, Loudness Meter Light, which is a pretty cool um, VST and uh, iPad app. So this is the first uh, iPlug 2 Thing to be on the uh, iOS App Store, as far as I know. Um, and it's quite a cool um, combination of uh, iPad app plus plugin. You can put a plugin in your DAW and visualize all of the, your um, various kind of metering needs on your iPad on your separate screen. So, yeah, really nice. Another one is this. Um, compressor from Hornet, and I just really like the aesthetic of this plugin. I think they use uh, vector graphics really well. Yeah, I mentioned my collaborator, Alex. He's um, Alex Harker, that is. He's, he's recently updated a bunch of open source plugins. Um, they're the His Tools, and this, this is the His Tools granular. There's a couple of other ones too. Um, and yeah, you can find them on his GitHub page. Um, they're doing some very nice and interesting kind of audio processing. So the last last one before I talk about a neural plugin is uh, this 303 emulator, which is, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure I like the aesthetics of this one, but it's pretty cool. Um, it's a web audio module and Ola uh, Vist Vistet, probably pronouncing the, his name wrong, um, has use this template that I made, which um, lets you, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a starting point template for an iPlug project, which has got GitHub Actions, which will build a web audio module and publish it to GitHub pages. Um, so you can visit the URL um, shown in, in the status bar there and uh, just start playing this 303 in the browser. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's pretty cool. So as promised, we get on to a neural plugin. And yeah, I, I just found this project on GitHub uh, a few months ago um, called neural, uh, neural Amp Modeler. And I was quite, quite pleased to see that, uh, that the plugin part of it was using iPlug. So what this is, it's, um, it's a bit like the Guitar ML project that got mentioned earlier. It's a... Um, AMP modeler that's based on neural networks. And it's it's got two components. One is a sort of Python repository for the training of the neural networks. And one is a plugin uh, component. And um, the developer, Steve Atkinson, has put lots of videos on his YouTube, which show him comparing this plugin um, and his his uh, network, neural network, to various uh, commercial offerings. And um, yeah, they're pretty, pretty close. And uh, he's made a Facebook group where lots of people are getting very excited about this and exchanging 
their own models. So yeah, this, this allows you to basically profile um, pedals. And if you've got like bits of amplifier, you can uh, make your own um, profiles of these things and then load them into the plugin. Um, so yeah, this is the Google Collab that um, he links to on the, the part of the repo um, or the part of the project that's got all the Python stuff. And this this kind of illustrates how how people uh, train neural networks. For the, for anyone who's watching who doesn't know about this stuff, uh, I, I am not an expert in it. I shall declare that now. But uh, he's made a, an easy easy mode collab and a more difficult um, advanced mode one. Um, but this is uh, basically a Jupyter notebook that's running uh, in the web browser and it's running, um, connecting to a, a server uh, which has got a GPU. So it's uh, it's got maybe four cells in this Jupyter notebook and um, you can download uh, the, the kind of input signal, which is like a 20 minute long WAV file of various excitations. Um, and it's kind of like a, like a DI'd signal that you would then run through some kind of process and generate another WAV file. Um, and you can upload your, your output.wav to the Google Collab um, file system on the left-hand side. And then you press a button in the Jupyter Notebook uh, or the Collab, and it starts the process of training the neural network. And um, yeah, this, this easy mode is using a particular model. I think it's looking at the screenshot, it's WaveNet. Um, and gradually you see that the neural network's accuracy gets better and better and better. And uh, eventually it, the, the training ends and it gives you a .nam file, which is some kind of format that he's put together, which includes the, the weights for the neural network. So then you can you can go back and um, load that into this plugin. So yeah, I, I saw this project on GitHub and I um, gave him some tips on how to use the latest iPlug2 template to, to make a, a better plugin and to, to build it all um, in the cloud using GitHub Actions. So yeah, this is more moving on now more to the um, topic of productionizing machine learning models. And um, the, the, the general workflow with this stuff is um, separated into a load of tools that get used in, in research um, and then a kind of different mode when you want to productionize things. And a lot of the, a lot of the resources online and the, the frameworks that are out there are very heavily skewed towards the research side. Um, and it can be a little bit frustrating when you're trying to use the, these models in a production context because you find that a lot of it is uh, kind of very linked to Python and the, the kind of tools that you, you do research with, you do training with, but not what you want to use when you're shipping a product. So yeah, typically when you're doing the research side of things, you're training a neural network or some kind of machine learning um, model, probably these days using PyTorch or, or TensorFlow, but it might also be using a more classical machine learning framework. Um, there's a, a few of them out there, scikit-learn is a popular one. Um, you're probably gonna export that model um, at the end to a certain kind of format and then maybe test that model a bit in, in Python, maybe for your use case, you, you can just use it in Python. Um, but when you want to actually productionize, it kind of depends on the context of what you're doing, but um, yeah, you're, you're probably gonna convert this model into some other format. Um, and then, yeah, a lot of the, the things that we're seeing that people are very excited about to do with machine learning, 
and AI, they're going to be using cloud-based infrastructure to do inferences on that model. Um, but obviously, we're, we're talking about neural audio plugins here, and um, that's, that's not really good for us. We want to do inference on the client side inside the DAW in a plugin. Um, so we need to use some kind of inference engine. And um, yeah, there's various options for this. And it really depends on what your requirements are. So yeah, you could write it yourself. And uh, this is what is going on with the neural audio, um, neural amp mod modeler plug plugin. Uh, also with some other projects um, that you'll find on GitHub. Um, you could use a library like RT Neural, which is it's also sort of, um, yeah, it's written by a Jatin. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a lightweight dependency and it, it's all gonna be built into your plugin binary um, and it's designed for real time. So this might be the right thing for your project. Um, it's gonna avoid you having to link to some third party library. Um, but it might not contain all of the uh, machine learning operators that your model requires. And um, especially if you're DIYing the whole thing, like you might spend an awful lot of time sort of reinventing the wheel and um, trying to optimize your machine learning models layers and things like this. Um, so yeah, that might not be the quickest option. Uh, it might it might be that you're forced to, to take that option uh, to DIY because the, the machine learning techniques that you're using in your Python models are so advanced that they don't exist in the various runtimes that are out there. Um, but yeah, I, ideally we'd, we'd like to use one of the, the runtimes, I think, that um, these machine learning frameworks come with. Um, but they have some some problems. Um, so yeah, TensorFlow, um, if you want to run a TensorFlow model in production, there's a few options that uh, I've investigated. You can actually download a DLL for lib TensorFlow. Um, and there's a thing called CPP flow, which lets you interact with it. But this TensorFlow DLL on, on Mac for, a, for an Intel, uh, Intel only build is it's nearly 500 megabytes, um, which is huge if you're going to ship an audio plugin. And uh, it's also like if, if everyone releases audio plugins that are all linking tensorflow.dll or .dilib, um, it's there's possible potential for conflicts. Um, it's just yeah, it's got loads of stuff in there that you're not going to be using in your model. Um, so yeah, it, it might be desirable to use something that's designed more for embedded systems or mobile, such as TensorFlow Lite, uh, which is specifically designed so that you can, uh, trim down the size of your, uh, your inference engine and, um, yeah, make something that's a bit more lightweight. Um, but if anyone's tried to, to build that, it's not much fun because it, it's part of the TensorFlow repository, which is this absolutely massive mono repo. Um, it doesn't have great documentation and it's got quite a complicated build system using this thing called Basil, which is uh, used by a lot of Google projects. And it's not as, uh, not as easy to, to build as, or to use as some other things. Um, yeah, a lot of people are using PyTorch and um, Torch Script, which is a slightly different process um, because, yeah, Torch Script is, as I understand it, is a way of annotating your Python um, code and then spitting out some kind of uh, format that will be runnable via the C++ API linking to the libtorch DLL. But yeah, I downloaded that earlier and it's also nearly 400 megabytes, um, not exactly what you want to ship with your 
BST, which is probably maximum 20 megabyte DLL or something like this. Um, yeah, so you've got to bear in mind as well, like if, if you're going to bundle a DLL with your in a, inside a, uh, a Mac OS bundle, um, you might be shipping bundles for VST audio unit, VST3 and CLAP maybe, um, and AAX. So are you going to put the DLL inside all of these Mac OS bundles? If you're going to like link all of these different plugins to the DLL, that DLL has got to be in a place that's accessible to the Mac OS sandbox these days. So yeah, ideally we don't really want to be linking to a, a DLL or a Dilib. Um, on Windows, there's also a bit of a dilemma about where, where you might put this DLL and whether you might, if you put it into Windows System 32, is, I'm not sure that's a great thing to do because other things might have put their DLLs in that place. Um, so yeah, ideally we don't really want to depend on a, a separate DLL and we'd like to bake all of our a machine learning inference into our plugin binary. So that is one of the reasons why I've sort of started experimenting with Onyx Runtime. Um, you can build a dynamic library with Onyx Runtime, but um, you can also build static libraries. It uses CMake um, and it's got a very nice build script and a lot of documentation. So this is a way to make a small library um, and yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what Onyx Runtime actually is in a second. Um, but yeah, there, there was a paper I wanted to mention here at, at the recent DAFX conference, uh, which is comparing all these different engines. Um, and yeah, I, I don't want to misquote them, but um, from their con conclusion, it, it sounded like that Onyx Runtime and TensorFlow Lite were um, performing better than LibTorch and TorchScript. But um, that might not be the whole story because perhaps you know, LibTorch supports certain operations that you just don't exist in the other things. That kind of problem is something you also have to consider. So yeah, Onyx is the open, or it stands for Open Neural Network Exchange. And it's, I'm just going to read their, their description here. It's an open format built to represent machine learning models. Uh, Onyx defines a common set of operators, the building blocks of machine learning and deep learning models, and a common file format to enable AI developers to use models with a variety of frameworks, tools, runtimes, and compilers. So yeah, the idea is that you can uh, export models from both Python, uh, sorry, PyTorch and uh, TensorFlow and sort of work uh, work with one runtime or, or sorry, work, uh, interchange models between frameworks. Um, there's also ways you can convert scikit-learn models to Onyx format. So yeah, Onyx is a separate thing to Onyx runtime, but Onyx Runtime is um, something Microsoft developed, which ingests a, a .onyx format model and uh, performs inference on it. Um, it also says it can do training. I haven't investigated that at all. But yeah, it's, it's a portable C++, sorry, C library with a nice C++ interface on top. Uh, and it's also got support for things like Swift, um, and you can compile to WebAssembly. So yeah, you can actually use it in things like Node.js. Um, and I've actually seen a Max for Live device recently, which used a model in Onyx format via the Node object in Max for Live, which um, then you can, <laughs> you can import Onyx runtime to your Node.js script and that in that way, make a machine learning based Max for Live device. So that was just an interesting thing. I, I don't know if that would make it valid for your competition, but um, yeah, you can use Onyx runtime in Max for Live. Um, anyway, as I said already, it's got a very nice 
build system based on CMake, CMake, very good documentation. And there's lots of options for configuring the inference depending on what hardware is available. So you can do inference just on the CPU, or you could use something like Core ML or Direct ML um, to do uh, hardware optimized um, inference using the GPU or the various uh, chips that you might have on an uh, M1 Apple laptop that can do um, machine learning stuff. Um, the way I'm using it at the moment is just using the CPU node. Um, but yeah, there's lots of options for um, doing inference in different ways. So what, what I have done is I've built an iPlug2 template repository, um, an example, uh, using a model that um, Steve Atkinson uh, exported from his neural AMP modeler, uh, Python script. So he converted one of these things to Onyx format for me. Um, and I've built a C++ class around that model um, that interacts with the Onyx runtime C++ API in order to load it um, and perform inference on that. So it's a very simple plugin project. Um, it also can compile to um, an iOS app or a standalone app on Mac or Windows. Um, and yeah, part of the pipeline is another repo which is called the ORT builder and this is a just a selection a collection of um, shell scripts to build a slim down version of the onyx runtime um, that just includes the operators required for your model so you you can put in a dot onyx format um, model into this repo. And uh, the idea is that you, you run a script, it will convert it to um, a slightly different format called o dot ORT. Then it will serialize that to C++ source code. And it, it will also generate a special file called a dot config file, which lists all of the um, Machine, line, machine learning operators that are required in your model. Uh, and it will, it will produce binaries. Um, so yeah, this originally I was making dynamic libraries of Onyx runtime, um, but I had some problems linking that to the audio unit version three on iOS. Um, and also like whenever you build a dynamic library and try and link it into a, a VST plugin, you have to mess around with like some uh, R path stuff. This, this is all very tedious technical detail, which but it's quite confusing, like making sure that your binary finds the DLL on Mac OS anyway. And what, what I much prefer is just to be able to link everything statically. So yeah, this, this um, repo will build um, a single static library on Mac and or on Apple platforms, it, it will generate a thing called an XE framework. And this is like a single file that you can drag into your uh, iPlug2 project or your even to a juice project. And um, if you link against that in, in Xcode, um, you will, it will statically link to um, and, and it will uh, kind of transparently work for all the different Apple targets um, so it supports the ios simulator um, or mac os on intel or mac os on arm um, so yeah that's that's quite handy um, so yeah the idea is that you include this as a sub module of your iplug2 project and use it as part of a ci pipeline so that whenever you change your onyx model it automatically generates the um, the artifacts and um, then builds them into your plugin. Um, 
Yeah, so that's kind of the end of the presentation, um, but I'd be really interested if if people uh, experiment with this. And you know, I, I haven't really tried um, any really advanced uh, models with this. I don't know how far it's going to get with in terms of using the CPU um, engine, whether it, we need to do some more uh, sophisticated um, things like what's going on in the in the, the new tone um, plugin that was presented at ADC, where I think you were doing stuff on a separate thread. Uh, and yeah, at, at the moment, there's some um, infrastructure in this example to, to make sure that the um, the Onyx inference is only working on buffer sizes of 128 samples at a time. Um, it does some buffering if, if the frame size going to the audio, audio plugin is different, um, but there's no resampling or anything like that. So that, that's something to add in the future. So that is uh, pretty much the end of the presentation. Um, Please come and uh, join us on the iPlug2 Discord um, if you want to get started. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions about this template. Um, I haven't quite got it working on Windows yet because the static library was two and a half gigabytes, um, which wasn't <laughs> it wasn't great uh, for um, a portable. Um, Thing. Uh, so yeah, I need to do some investigations to, to get it working nicely with Windows. Um, I also hope that I might get it working with WebAssembly because iPlug2 can spit out a web page and it would be pretty cool if you could make a neural plugin with the same code that run in the browser. So yeah, I also have links to all of the things that I've had slides about and I'll put them in the um, comments on the YouTube um, discussion. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Oli. That was that was a great rundown of, uh, of different options for um, building your own <clears throat> neural audio plugin and uh, very educational. I really enjoyed that. So let's see. So we just not really any questions here. Just a comment that says uh, this comment from George that says, if you do figure out how to build the dynamic library linked into a dynamic plugin, I would be very interested in that. Um, and uh, I, I do know how to do that. It's just uh, just a bit painful. But uh, if you find me on on one of the Discord channels that I'm on, we can talk about it. <laughs> Fantastic. So that's that's Architect on uh, Discord. So Architect George, please uh, get in touch with Oli, and he can tell you how to do it. Uh, so there's another comment from Mr. Damien, uh, who says Onyx Runtime is great for doing machine learning and plugins, super happy that you managed to make it a static library. It was my main issue when I was playing with it. Uh, however, Audix models are not stateful and they do not remember anything from one run to the next. Is there any solution regarding this? So I think the solution is to add layers which point to um, extra tensors that you you maintain in your C++ code. So if you look at the source code um, for this LS, LTSM model that I've, I've uh, implemented, there's actually three tensors that are um, passed for input and output, which basically point to kind of scratch buffers that exist in the C++ code. So I think that is how um, it, it does the statefulness if you see what I mean. Fantastic. Um, this is something I would love to do at some point, but there's a question from Craig that asks, are there any tutorials or courses free or paid that introduce a beginner to the iPlug2 framework? If you'd like to do some tutorials, I'd, just, I'd love to have them on the channel. I'd love to show people how to, how to do it. Um, it's, yeah, it's something that I want to do. Uh, I, don't have a great deal of time, but um, yeah, this is this is on our minds. Uh, something that we might use some of our funding to to organise. Um, there is a, an iPlug two 
uh, tutorial on music hackspace but that is from two years ago so it's a little bit out of date uh, it's mainly focused on the web web based stuff um so yeah hopefully we'll improve our documentation and tutorials soon great big shout out to jb and music hackspace uh, and let's see what else do we have so uh mr damien commented on your response regarding um <clears throat> the statefulness of onyx models and says uh, yes with external states it works but for streaming convolutions it's not ideal <laughs> okay i i'm a bit of a neural network beginner so uh yeah i'm i'll take your word for it but uh... so uh so i believe that you answered this a little bit earlier with your with the example that you had linked to using the iplug2 framework um but oliver asks i've been struggling to imagine exactly how machine learning and or neural networks <clears throat> are actually used in the context of audio plugins do you know of any examples of how neural audio plugins work so uh so we we pointed out a couple examples there's the work that the google magenta project did with uh using max for live devices there's the there's the plugin that uh that you used that you linked to earlier that uses iplug2 um are there any um yeah i mean i could any? also add to that yeah i think one uh, example that we've been seeing more and more of uh, in the past like couple of years is this idea of like tombra transfer so like going from like one um input sounds and mapping it to like another uh sound that's based on what the model's been trained on so like you can imagine like voice being converted to like an <clears throat> instrument or you know something like like that and that can be obviously useful for exploration and um and depending on what sort of projects you're doing like for sound design for example um so that i mean that's one one use case but the, there's obviously so many so many other applications as well for it um you know and uh, for like you know audio mixing and uh, as well um as like a, a, and and then also just you know audio, audio synthesis um generating uh different uh, materials as well using uh, um unconditionally from using neural networks um so mm -hmm. yeah just a there's just a few examples but there's like many many more obviously uh, outside <clears throat> of you know, amp modeling and you know things like that. There's 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 lots that can be um done with neural networks in the DAW and as part of a plugin. Fantastic. Um so this is a great question from Wesley who says uh I'm a Python developer working with AI. How could I contribute to audio plugin development? And um uh, I could maybe help answer that. So that's a common as a common scenario that I imagine people have. Uh, so there may be people that are great at building plugins using a framework like iPlug2 or Juice, but want to team up with a person that uh, knows a lot about machine learning, neural audio, or AI. And um, the Discord group uh, that we have on the audio programmer is a great place to do that. Uh, it's specifically for these types of collaborations. So don't feel, uh, I, I, I encourage you that if, that if you're not an expert in all areas of building in, uh, I mean, this is a brand new, brand new area in audio. So um, please don't feel intimidated if you don't um, have it all down and can just pull out a uh, a neural audio plugin just with a snap of the finger. Um, this is a competition that's built for collaborations and for people to learn together. So please join uh, the audio programmer discord um i'll put the uh, link uh in the chat again very shortly and it's also in the video description and um, and join us and talk about it talk about um if you have questions around neural audio please feel free to join uh and ask ask away so um <clears throat> i'll give a couple more seconds to or anybody else that may have any questions um in the meantime any any closing question uh, i had thoughts, one thoughts yeah yes. i had one uh, one question for ollie actually just like um you know around all the, the sort of web and um, work that you're you've been doing like super excited about uh, the prospects of potentially having some new audio plugins in the web 
I'm just wondering, like, from you know your um, experience so far working with the Onyx framework um, and building a, a high plug to a VST plugin or, or plugin in general using uh, Onyx. What sort of challenges do you sort of foresee or envision with like trying to get that um, compelling to Wasm and getting that sort of in the web? Is there any th- potential things you've you've seen working with like the Onyx framework that you think it could be challenging to get it running in the web like that? Um, it seems to me like WebAssembly is a kind of first class citizen um, part of the Onyx uh, runtimes. Like they really seem uh, to want to deliver that. So um, I hope that there wouldn't be any major blockers um so yeah they, they provide various options um if you build the web assembly version um so you can support uh simd in uh like it's a very relatively recent addition to web assembly spec i think is simd support so um yeah there, there might be some compatibility things like if your neural network absolutely requires simd yeah, I don't know quite what the status of that is in terms of browser support, um, whether it works on like all mobile devices and that kind of thing. Um, so that that might be something to think about. Um, yeah, I haven't actually got to the stage of trying to link the WebAssembly um, library to the iPlug WebAssembly. And um, because of the way that um, you do uh kind of uh audio worklets and things in in the web audio api uh it requires you to have like one one part that's quite isolated for the dsp and in, in iplugs case because we're doing the gui in c plus plus as well there's another bit of web assembly for the gui and there's there's certain sandboxing requirements on the bit that runs the dsp because it's kind of got elevated privileges it's on a higher priority thread um so i i'm a little bit concerned about maybe something in the onyx runtime wasm wouldn't be allowed in that context which would be annoying <laughs> but <laughs> i have to find out yeah. yeah and then just another comment like i obviously I, I didn't realize that you had a script that allowed you to to like essentially export um a GitHub IO page uh, from a from a project, and uh, I'd like to see more uh, uh, published research uh, using uh, web audio plugins, like as part of like a GitHub IO to demonstrate their work uh, and their research. I think that'd be really cool, um, and the way forward, I think, to be a lot more interactive with the the published research that's coming out. Yeah, there have been some cool developments lately with like WebAssembly versions of um, Jupyter Notebooks. So you can put sort of interactive Jupyter Notebooks in, in web pages and yeah, exciting times. So I, I would like to improve the iPlug web stuff so that you can much more easily embed little plugins everywhere. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that's time, not enough of it. Absolutely. Cool. Uh, I, I, this feels like a great natural place for us to wrap up. Thank you very much, Oli, for, for that awesome presentation. And um, Welcome. Yeah. Thanks for having me.